Deb, we'll uh, see if we can leave a few minutes for questions. <clears throat> and then maybe, also I wanna make sure that people are, are aware, because I know people, some people have had to leave, that this evening we'll have a very special uh, discussion uh, of the legacy and the memorialization of the 50th anniversary of Kennedy's assassination. And you know, there's been a number of references to this, and I think it'll become clear from the panel both what might have happened, what we lost, what it did to the country, and uh, from another member of the uh, so-called basement team, uh, a picture of what LaRouche has defined as this fusion-driven future economy, future world really, not just an economy, future culture that we're about. Now, all, what, I, what I just want to address is a couple of points uh, to, to get across. Because look, a lot of the times we discuss these things, everybody, it, it, you know, I must admit, I, I don't want to offend anybody because we are in a church, but a lot of times uh, people treat it like religion. In other words, these are pleasant words that you hear every Sunday or Saturday or Friday, depending on your denomination, or, uh, and you nod, and this is true, and this is, isn't it beautiful, mankind is creative, mankind is in the image of the creator, uh, or any other version of this. And then people go, or I think in this point, it becomes very important to grasp LaRouche's point. We are not creatures of the senses. We are not creatures of the mortal flesh. We are a different kind of creature. Very good. We're not part of simply the biosphere, as, and we'll, I'll reference a little bit of that. We're not, we're not a creature that reproduces itself biologically. We do have to reproduce ourselves biologically, but we don't really reproduce the human species biologically. We reproduce the human species by reproducing the species as a whole, by reproducing society, civilization, by making certain kinds of advances. And if we don't make those advances, we lose not just civilization ultimately, but the species. And it, from this standpoint, I would like to approach in a minute what uh, LaRouche has been getting at, as Megan referred to in this series of papers, or at least an idea of what he's getting at, not, not probably the full idea, but the idea that the, the creative uh, capability of the human individual, the creative capability of the species is what I might call, or what Lynn has called, a strategic necessity. This is not a question of it's nice to be creative and we all get to feel good once a week or twice a week or maybe we think we're so good we, we're like that all the time. This is something that's a requirement for the existence of the human species. And in a certain sense, we have to get beyond a conception of ourselves as limited to our mortal existence, our sensory experience. Because really, our opportunity to be human doesn't occur in the same way that it does to an animal. You know, animals are animals. They, they, uh, they, it, doesn't, it doesn't require a great deal of genius to see that animals live a relatively brutal existence. It's a, it really is a dog-eat-dog -dog world in the animal kingdom. There's, there's, there's no way around it. Just throw a little bit of food in front of an animal and they'll eat, they'll eat it, whatever it is almost. You know, there are certain things, cats don't eat a lot of berries, but you know, <laughs> cats are sort of what they call super predators, so they only eat meat. I think hyenas might be close to that. You know, dogs are a little more omnivorous, but you know, dogs just will eat you out of house and home. You know, dogs have no mechanism to stop eating. So you can kill a dog by overfeeding it. It's a good example of the way animals operate. It won't stop. And you know, all they do, their, their entire drive is individual reproduction. I'm not even sure it's useful to talk about pleasure. Mostly they 
try to avoid pain, but there are certain things that they're driven to do, and that's the way they survive. Human beings, we exist by a social organization around new ideas, discoveries of principle, as Lynn keeps saying. Now, that requires a certain kind of society. In that sense, that's why culture comes first, because we're trying to create creative people. You have to have, you have, to have a society and a culture that's oriented not just to saying we, uh, we value human beings, we value creativity, but we have to create creative human beings. It's an active principle. We have to have the circumstances under which the likelihood of the creative powers of the individual, the ability to discover and express new ideas, is developed. Now, in this sense, I think one of the problems people have in the modern time, in the modern era, is we're not necessarily at the most advanced point in history. We may have, because of the benefits of previous people, we may have advanced technologies. We may have advanced capabilities. Thankfully, we have some advances in agriculture so that we can feed, really, and that, you know, probably we don't have the ability to feed 7 billion people. Maybe right now with 7 billion people on the planet, we have enough to feed 4 or 5 or 6 billion people decently. But we could produce enough for 10 or 12 or 15 billion. But the society has gone backwards, and largely in the culture, in the, in the following sense. We do have, from previous scientific development, even at this moment, the ability, if we chose to, to feed the world. We could feed 7 billion people at approximately the level, or maybe a little bit less given the obesity problem in the United States, of people in the United States. You might want to cut back a few calories here and there. But the basic idea would be to produce enough to feed the global population at a decent standard of living. We have that. We do have the ability, for example, as was mentioned earlier, we'll come back to probably, Think of where we are. Take the case of fusion power. We have known of the potential of fusion power from the very beginning of nuclear science. At least it was conceived of as a possibility. By the 1950s, we already had fusion projects in very initial stages at places like the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. This was known, obviously we knew something about fusion from the, fusion, the hydrogen bomb or the thermonuclear bomb. We certainly knew that a fusion process a lot smaller than the sun was possible. By the 1970s, we had programs, more programs than we have today, to develop fusion power. Now, what was fusion power, like uh, the nuclear bomb, based on? It was based on a discovery of principle by the aforementioned Einstein. And what was that principle? It was interesting because I think it's a principle that violates sense perception in two forms. It was based on relativity theory. Now, most people have a bad idea of relativity theory because of the word. I mean, e even Einstein at a certain point didn't like the word because people think, well, it's subjective. What Einstein said was everything, it depends on where you're looking at it from or how fast you're moving. That's, that's not what Einstein did. What Einstein did was actually go outside of subjectivity because he said, given that we know we can't have an absolute measurement, how can I reach the standpoint of finding what doesn't change amongst all the different viewpoints, amongst all the different possible frames of reference, as he refers to them? What's invariant? What doesn't change? What's the underlying principle? And the same thing goes for general relativity, at which point you go beyond the visualizable. Most of modern science today is not something you could visualize, or most of the frontiers. These are, these are concepts, and they're not mathematical concepts. They're concepts, as Planck and Einstein identify them, of a certain kind of imagination. And it's an artistic imagination. It's an imagination within which the new idea performs the act 
of re reshaping the entirety of our conception of the universe. So it has to be a, an idea coherent with that reshaping of the universe, with that redevelopment of our conception of who we are, of who, what, how the universe works. And so these things are something of the creative or the artistic imagination. Now, of course, in the course of this, Einstein recognized that since in, uh, in, in special relativity, there's really no proper distinction between energy and matter. That indeed, matter had a relationship to energy and energy to matter. And in some ways, the way we use the word energy is, is a little bit of a problem. Because energy is not really exactly a quantity. Energy is not a scalar. Energy is an ability to perform work, which means a reorganization of activity. And this is where people get confused about a lot of this stuff on green technologies. That's why Lynn uses the word energy flux density. Because you can produce a lot of energy that's spread over a, a broad area. And you can move certain things with it. But you can't, for example, penetrate, uh, for example, a piece of armor. You know, if you took a 1,000 pound wall and moved it one, sh one inch a minute, there's a certain amount of force in that. But it ain't going to do much to anybody. You take a, a couple of ounces of lead and shoot it at 1,000 miles per minute, you can do a lot of damage. There's energy, there's a, that's, just, that's a crude example. You can think of a, a knife as an example. Because what, what is it that the ability to, to create steel or stone that has a sharp edge? You take the same force and you can cut something you otherwise couldn't cut. So the ability to produce a lot of energy may not be transformable into change, into work. We now have the ability to hone ourselves down to looking, in a certain sense, to peering inside the workings of the infinitely small or the infinitely large. Now what Einstein discovered is that indeed there's a transformation of mass into energy at a somewhat incredible rate. You know, think about E equals mc squared, the famous equation, which you really get from the, from the, uh, the work in special relativity in terms of what's the underlying invariant of looking at the motion, for example, of a pendulum from different velocities. And you find this pendulum has different action, different amount of work done, and so forth. So what Einstein discovered is, you think of it, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. So in one pound, if you could take anything, if you could convert it in some fashion, if it would turn itself from mass into energy, it would be one pound times 186,000 miles per second squared. That's a big number. OK? So imagine, so we find that from a few grams or a few pounds that we put through a certain transformation, a certain acceleration, we can produce large amounts of energy. So for example, in fusion, there's what they call a mass defect. It's the same thing in fission. When you split U-235, the two atoms that you're left with have a mass that's less than the original mass. And what's happening is that small amount of mass is being converted into energy because its velocity is enormous. And at those velocities, energy is produced. In the case of fusion, so actually, you're taking um, a couple of hydrogen atoms and fusing them to form helium. But there's a mass defect. The helium atom produced has a slightly less mass than the two hydrogen atoms. And it's more comp there's more to it than that. But that gives you a, a simple idea. Obvi however, the fusion process requires, uh, it, fission required a, a knowledge of what was the shape and what was the nature of the, of the nucleus of the atom. And it was only when they realized certain, el certain aspects of the shape of the atom that fission became possible. 
And there was, that was the beginning of nuclear fission, nuclear fission as a source of weaponry and, and energy. In the case of fusion, you have to, there, there, there's a, a, at one level a tendency for repulsion when these two nuclei strip down come together. The, the typical idea, most people know this from electricity, is uh, you know, uh, two positive charges repel, or two negative charges repel. Now, there's good reason to think that if we knew more about the physics, and there are people who did this in the 19th century, and we've got some reports on that, that indeed there really isn't this so-called Coulomb barrier, that something occurs under the right circumstances that overcomes, but really doesn't, but changes the relationship of the charges. And so you get fusion. Now, we've done a little bit of this, so think about it. From what little we've known, we've done something in a building maybe the size of this room, maybe a little bigger, that it takes an entire star to do in nature. Now, it does occur, although there's more to what goes on in the sun than we even know now. There's a lot we don't know about the sun. There's a lot we don't know about the planet Earth. People, we really don't know what's in the center of the planet Earth. There's a theory, but it may not be right. It hasn't been confirmed. We don't exactly know, for example, why the magnetic field of the planet Earth flips the north and south poles periodically. And we don't even know what the consequences of that are. Now, but what we do, in fact, is something that doesn't occur in nature. We, by understanding the principle, we do something that does not occur in nature. Fusion doesn't occur in rooms the size of this, unless it's a neutron star, and you know, then you've got something that's, you know, one square centimeter weighs a couple of zillion tons or something. But anyway, um, uh, you know, you don't, this is not a process you get under the limited circumstances. We can do that. We can create controlled nuclear fission. Controlled nuclear fission does not occur in nature. Almost nothing that human beings have done occurs in nature. We, birds, of course, we, we, it's fascinating to see what birds do to fly. And there's been a relationship between a bird flying and an airplane flying. You know, fighter jets look a little bit like small birds with short, stubby, swept wings, and, you know, bombers look a little bit like geese landing. But nature doesn't produce metallic objects that fly, let alone things that move along on rubber wheels. But anyway, the, uh, yeah, yeah. so what do we do? We change our relationship to nature. Now, we can say two things. One thing, you know, human beings have been like this. In a certain sense, the only way to define the existence of human beings is through a conception of the human being doing something creative. You don't find it in the bones. This is, you know, people are, you know, it's interesting, paleontology, homo this and homo that. It, it's interesting. It's, it's a little bit like looking into the eyes of the past. And you want to see how far back it goes and what happened. What did our ancestors do? But you're not going to get, you don't identify human, be, human activity physiologically. Upright posture did not create human beings. Opposable thumbs did not create human beings. That may have been useful. But what makes us human identifiably is evidence of the mind. Evidence of something that shows a, a, a process of thought, of ideas, of creativity that changes, that constantly changes its relationship to nature. So we start with something like fire, and it is true. We don't, we don't know how far back fire goes, but it, minimally we know that it goes back probably six or seven hundred thousand years. There's good evidence that man's use of fire goes back two million years. 
interestingly enough, to a creature that doesn't really look all that much like us. Upright, but a little, little, you'd think of it as a little bit strange. Now, what does it do? We've changed our relationship to nature. What's the point of controlling fire? No, every animal in the world is afraid of fire, except for moths, you know, who fly into it, okay? Uh, or other insects and things like that. But uh, most mammals are afraid of fire. Now, human beings do two things with fire, and really it leads to a third. Number one, we change our relationship to the chemistry of our food. We break, in other words, there's all kinds of things we wouldn't digest in large amounts unless they're cooked. And that cooking changes the chemical bonds. And so we can ingest all kinds of food that we shouldn't be able to ingest, not at least in, in larger amounts. Largely, proteins. Secondly, obviously, it's warmth. It means we can conquer certain environments. And number three, we begin to use our control of fire to change our, our overall capabilities. You can process, you're no longer stuck with stone tools. You begin to be able to process ores, even at a relatively early stage. You can shape uh, tools. You've begun the process of, in a sense, machine tool making, where you can create tools that reshape your other tools. You can shape, change your relationship to nature. What happens to human beings? We become capable of changing our environment, and these tools, these ideas, are communicated to other human beings. Because in general, we're not capable of doing this by ourselves. We create a social organization which allows us to use nature as a resource. Except every resource is by its nature finite relative to the science and technology. And indeed, it's not just finite in the sense that it's going to run out eventually. And then you get the silliness about, well, you know, if we use oil more slowly, it'll last longer. But anybody, any child has the obvious question. Well, all right, it's going to last longer, but it's not going to last forever. Unless we slow down so much that we go extinct. Then there might be some left over that nothing else can use. <laughs> and that's sort of the green argument. You know, we want to leave the planet so that when we're all extinct, it'll still be there. <laughs> you know, probably if that's the route that we go, it will still be there. Although in the nature of things, eventually the sun blows up, <clears throat> the earth gets consumed, and what was it all about? But we can change the destiny of things even like the human species. So, and of course, these things are really finite even before we get to these existential points. Because the further we have to go for the resource, the more expensive it becomes socially. I'm not talking about dollars. I'm talking about physical economy. It becomes, we have to travel further, distances. You use energy to travel the distances. It takes more to get it out. Even the fascination with fracking and so forth. There's far more that goes into fracking than the original oil finds. Shipment. And of course, it, it restricts us in a way that nuclear resources don't restrict us. Nuclear resources are relatively easily moved across the planet. And of course, once we get to fusion, we have the resource of not only the ocean, but for example, in more developed forms of fusion, helium-3, which is abundant on the moon. We're talking about, at present rates, energy sources that we could use at high energy flux densities and increasing energy flux densities for thousands of years at the present rate of usage. But of course, this would give us the capability to move on to other forms of action in the universe, such as matter, antimatter, which we now know more about than we did before. We can produce some of it. We know that some of it's produced in the atmosphere, although in very small amounts. But we're beginning at an idea, of, but you would need power sources that allowed you to investigate in very small cross-sections the activity of 
electrons, protons, and so on and so forth. Now, what does all this mean? Because we look at human history, it, we've had a process of development when it's gone right. We went from, you know, accidental fire almost, to wood burning and so on and so forth, to coal, to oil, to fishing. We've gone through a series of processes in other areas of our knowledge. That's just one that people are aware of. We've got medical capabilities. Health, you know, health, people don't realize how, much, how different the world is in ways that most people just don't want to think about. Like you, you realize 100 years ago, lifespans were 40 and 50 years. Not that much different than the 15th or 16th century. Largely, the problem that we've overcome in the last 100 years, 120 years, is sanitation. That's the biggest addition to human lifespan. We don't die willy-nilly of infections. And most of the things that wiped people out, plague, tuberculosis, things like that, are at least manageable under the right conditions. But what's the invariant here? The invariant is the ability to discover, the ability to go beyond present knowledge, to create ideas that reshape the way human beings live and our relationship to nature. All of a sudden, we have an ability to get off the planet. Therefore, we can look at the planet from above and have a much greater picture of what our resources are. We can do more than that. And think about how much we've stopped thinking that way. And then you get to the culture point. Why have we stopped thinking that way? Why are we so insistent that it can't be done, it's too expensive? Now, I'll tell you, a lot of it is something we don't have the time to go into right here. Monetarism. The worship of money. Now, again, that's, that's another example, because you know, you know, people say, yeah, you're right, you know, money, money. But then tomorrow morning, somebody says we need to do something for the poor of this nation. Well, we, we don't have that money. You know, Ted Cruz, you know, a, a great, uh, uh, now one of the, uh, I don't know, what do you call it, celebrities of the Tea Party, What's his line on poor people or people that can't afford health care? Oh, well, if you can't afford it, get a job. Now, this is get a job where we got 15% unemployment by official figures, if you include underemployed people who have dropped out of the labor force and so on. Now, Obamacare isn't about health care. It's about killing people. There's a, it's, it's not a matter of you know, too much government. It's too much killing of people. It's called murder. We have a Hitlerian policy. Up to now, we've had a Hitlerian policy. We're now about to ha have Hitlerian levels of killing and motivations and intentions. So what's going wrong in the culture? Why do we think we can't, you know, of course, why do we think we can't go to the moon? You know, I, this kills me because I'm at a certain age. 1972, we went to the moon. We're now at 2013. By we right now, I mean the United States. Right now, we're at, at 2013. That's 41 years later. Now, think about this. There's a great plan to get back to the moon in 15 years. And they call that progress. <laughs> Obama's proud to say we're going to land. You know, it might be a, not a bad idea to land on an asteroid. When? You know, 10, 15 years. We could have done that 30 years ago. But we, we become a nation that says, no, you can't. You know, some of it comes in this point that Dr. Chang made, uh, not in my backyard. The Tennessee Valley Authority was built in people's backyard. <laughs> and you know what? They were better off for it. Now, I think you can just take things away from people. But if you have a sense of mission, of national purpose, those things can be done. So what is it? Well, it's the reproduction of creative, uh, creativity. It's the most strategic thing that we have, the one necessity. Why? Because what is our purpose in life? Let's, uh, like uh, Megan, the last 120 years have been, it's, yes, since Kennedy, but the way to look at Kennedy's assassination, which will be discussed tonight, it, it was the end of a process. It wasn't the beginning of the process. The 20th century 
was largely the loss of the idea of human creativity. From the firing of Bismarck to World War I, to the attack on Planck and Einstein by Bertrand Russell and Niels Bohr and company, the introduction of pure reductionism, of logicism, of artificial intelligence, of the idea that computers can think. We've had, a, we've had a miserable dark age with respect to the human mind. We've had mass killing on a scale unheard of, and we're about to make that look petty. I just saw, for example, a, a point one of one of my colleagues uh, had to do a, a, a eulogy over a friend of ours, an ambassador, from an African country ambassador, I think from Ghana. Uh, I'm not sure if it was from Ghana or Kenya. Anyway, he, he was one of the people killed in Westgate in Kenya when there was that terror incident. So one of, our, one of my friends uh, uh, that went to the funeral and gave a eulogy. And in the course of the eulogy, he made the point that out of seven million children a year, that die between the birth and the age of five. Three and a half million occur in sub-Saharan Africa. 9,000 children a day die in southern Africa or sub-Saharan Africa. So, and we have people who say the problem is they don't have enough money. Well, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but money is the same thing as sense perception. This idea of free market money, and the money is the value of an economy, is anti-human. It's anti-creative. And we never lived that way. We never did live that way. We lived by actual creative discovery. Society has to be built on the idea that we create in each member of, of this, uh, particularly children, the ability to, the, the desire to be creative, to work at ideas. And that's where cla classical art becomes the key to it. Because what do you, you can't, a scientific discovery occurs over a certain amount of time. And it's the collaboration of a certain number of individuals. Problems come up, we discover technologies, we experience more of the universe. In classical art, you can take ideas and in a sense develop them as a, a, almost as though you're the creator of the universe of that idea unfolding in the drama, in the poetry, in the music. And in a sense, you get a, you get a sense of the, the non-empirical. You get a sense of something that is outside of normal time, or what in, in, in theological terms is sometimes referred to as the simultaneity of eternity. You live in time, but you're experiencing the creation of something that draws you into its identity that draws you, therefore, into the future. Where is this idea going? And so in one sense, the creative artist, the music, the composer, Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Schiller, Shakespeare, they're developing a universe on the stage or in the poem, which unfolds an idea that you begin to think about before its conclusion. And you begin to think then about how that kind of idea can be unfolded in human history by communicating it to other human beings. And you're drawn to this, and you're outside of sense perception, because you don't see the future. You don't feel the future. You know what needs to be created for the human species to have a future. So it's not, it's not a mystical vision. I'm often inclined to think people talk about visions because it conforms to sense perception. You can't really communicate a vision in that sense, but you can communicate an idea. And therein lies the spirit of human beings. And you see this, this is why to a certain extent we have the musical presentations and other presentations. So it's a very interesting thing. I'll, I'll conclude on this just to be a little oblique. Um, uh, uh, LaRouche has talked a lot about the role of drama. And of course, in, in the world of sense perception, the point that he makes about sense perception is that we're experiencing shadows of reality. You know, we have a sensory apparatus, but what we see, feel, touch, and hear conforms to our biological sensory apparatus. It's a signal of a certain kind, 
but it's really a clue to what you don't know. What went wrong? What, what doesn't m match up? What, when we set up an experiment, does or doesn't work? So they're clues, but to do anything serious, you have to go beyond sense perception. When you create an experiment, you have a hypothesis about what might happen that you didn't experience, as Planck was talking about. So you're, you're looking at something that you don't experience. You don't have that. Now, so Lynn talks about that perception is a shadow of reality. It's a projection of the real world. This, this is science. This is what Planck and Einstein are talking about. You have a certain set of experiences, but there's something unseen that's making those things happen. Now, when we talk about the theater, what's going on in the theater? In a drama, you have players on the stage. But remember, they're not the people in the play. The people in the play might be the, you know, centuries before or centuries after, or the, they're not the same time, place, etc. They're actors. And the actors are not the reality. They're performing the idea of the composer expressed in certain characters. But those characters themselves are shadows of the reality that the composer sees, that the, the author, like a Shakespeare. So the, Shakespeare has an idea expressed in the drama. And the drama is then carried out by actors who represent the characters who are really themselves shadows of reality. And one of the more interesting things I found, which some other people may know, but I just, is that the word for a, one of the words for actor in the time of Shakespeare was shadow. The actors were referred to as shadows. They're the shade of the character and the shade of the composer. Now, when you have a culture that at least begins to draw that out of people, to make them think about their own minds, you're not just receiving information. You're not just experiencing something. There's some, you might think of what happens as food for your mind. But you have to realize that you have to activate your mind. You have to have respect, not only for your mind, but for the mind of the people you're working with. You know, one of the great problems in human relations is we begin to think of other people as objects. They're just things. They're creatures. They're, they're trying to take something away from us. They're trying to invade our space. Or in the case of uh, male-female relations, they're an object of my pleasure or my pride. But they're not an object of intellectual discussion. They're not an object of creativity. They don't have minds. There's something else there. So we have to think about not only making discoveries, and there's a, a great deal to, as Megan went through and so forth, but we also have to think in terms of the fact that what the, our, our great obstacle in having a society that has that kind of continuous progress, and that's what human, the human species is. Continue, our substance is change. What makes us human is creativity. Everything else is less than human. So we have to live by what makes us what we are. So the creative powers of every human being is to our benefit. Therefore, we wish to give people the opportunity to be creative, to develop their powers, to contribute to the future. You know, and uh, this is what Lynn, this is what this is our only immortality. I don't want I, I don't want anybody to leave here thinking immortality is somehow you're going to live forever. You're kind of going to float away, and your real substance is going to be out of this shade of pleasure and pain, the veil, you know, and somehow you're going to... No, the real trick is you know that you're not going to be around forever as an individual person. But the species has a possibility of being immortal. Not a given, but we're a species that changes, that controls our environment, that discovers principle. So therefore, we could do what no animal can do. We could be an immortal species. And your real purpose in life 
is not to, you know, not, not that everything is gray and so forth, but your real purpose in life is to contribute, to take the joy and pleasure of knowing you fought and cr contributed to that future. That in a sense, that's how you see something that is immeasurable in time. And that's culture. That's the way we can express this as individual human beings in classical composition, cl classical creation, really. Okay? I'll leave it at that. Yeah.